Okay, I hear you, Ed. Very good evening to everybody and uh, welcome to Candid Conversations from Lockdown. This, I believe, is episode eight or could be nine. I lose track. We lose track of the days here in lockdown in isolation. Uh, my very special guest this evening is not a rider, but of course we are in that uh, season of horse sickness. So we thought it prudent that we'd have a little bit of a chat about where we were at uh, in South Africa. And of course, there is news that all sickness has spread far and wide. And uh, very good evening to Professor Alan Guthrie from the University of Pretoria. How are you? I'm very well, Ed. And yourself? Good, thank you. Alan, horse sickness, Thailand, what is happening? What's gone on? Yes, Aidan. Uh, they. Their first case of African horse sickness happened towards the end of February and uh, they had a single horse die and then it was about two weeks later that they started getting other cases, middle of March. And towards the end of March, they, well, they realized they had something going on. They thought it was African horse sickness uh, and they confirmed the diagnosis to the OIE on the 23rd, uh, 24th of March. And obviously, they have been implementing control measures since then. Uh, they immediately implemented a movement ban on horses. So not only do they have a COVID lockdown there, but their horses also have a horse sickness lockdown. Uh, and they've done it basically countrywide. Uh, also, obviously, the climate there is uh, tropical, They're just north of the equator. So, the huge thing there is, you know, it's meant to be their cooler season, but obviously there are enough midges to be transmitting African horse sickness very, very uh, efficiently. So uh, they have initially started with uh, putting in uh, insect nets and uh, people have been really enterprising about how they've done it with insect nets and insecticides and repellents. So all the things we use, obviously, uh, they have a totally naive population, except maybe for a few endurance horses, which in fact came from originally from South Africa, which then went via the Middle East to uh, Thailand, uh, who would have been vaccinated before they left here. So yes, there have been a few horses, which when they've checked later in their passport that uh, they haven't had an issue, uh, they happen to be the South African horses that were vaccinated before they left uh, this country. Um, then earlier this week, they did receive vaccine. So they have started vaccinating in the areas where they've got uh, deaths. They've got uh, basically six foci, like so often happens with uh, these sort of things. Started off in one place and you had people saying, well, horses are dying there. I'm going to get my horses the hell out of it. And so they ended up with another uh, five foci, which essentially, oh, sorry, four others which are linked to movement, one which appears to be a spread from the other one. So uh, yes, it's a tragedy. And um, obviously we'll have to see how it goes from here. It depends very, very much on weather conditions and uh, how effective the control measures are uh, to bring it under control. Now, do we know how it got there? What happened? Uh, where the horses uh, got the disease from? Uh, look, there's a lot of speculation out there what's, uh, what's going on. Obviously, uh, most likely is movement of an infected equid into the country. Uh, the Thai veterinary authorities are following up on movements of all equids into uh, Thailand over the last few months. I haven't seen any uh, reports on what they've come up with as yet, but uh, I suspect uh, once they've finished doing all the digging, we're going to find that there's a link to movement of an equid from Africa. Now, this is obviously presents a huge challenge for them because, like you were saying, it's a tropical climate here in South Africa. When temperatures drop, um, we kind of get it under control. They don't have the luxury of uh, cooler temperatures. So is this going to run rampant? I mean, and, and how well, big a horse population do they have? Uh, Thailand itself has a horse population of about 12,000 horses. So it's a similar sort of population to our controlled area or the surveillance zone down in the Cape. So it's a fairly small population. Uh, the bigger concern is, obviously, if you look at the countries around uh, uh, Thailand, 
to the east, you've got, uh, to the immediate east, you've got Cambodia and uh, Laos. Uh, the closest cases are about, uh, uh, about 100 kilometers from Cambodia at the moment, uh, but obviously uh, it's very flat. And so movement across there could maybe be quite easy, one doesn't know. Uh, then obviously uh, you've got Laos, which is slightly further to the north. And then surrounding those two is Vietnam. And if you look at the horse populations in uh, those three countries, between the three countries, they've got about 120,000 horses. Most of those are working equids, which obviously play a crucial role in the livelihoods of the people. Uh, so yes, there's a threat uh, with that. Uh, then to the west, obviously, uh, Thailand, the western boundary, you have um, Myanmar, uh, which comes all the way down and basically runs right down the western boundary of Thailand, all the way uh, to where Thailand and Malaysia join with each other, or close to that. So you've got, um, you know, other countries bordering them. Myanmar itself has uh, in excess of 100,000 horses. And obviously not far away from Laos and Cambodia and obviously Myanmar bordering those countries is mainland China. And mainland China has in excess of 7 million uh, uh, domesticated equids. So obviously it is uh, a, a big concern. Obviously mainland China itself doesn't have that much uh, uh, racing at this stage, but obviously the special administrative region of, uh, of uh, Hong Kong is the uh, uh, most active and richest uh, uh, racing jurisdiction in the world, I'd say, or uh, generates the most income, I'd say. Uh, the, so obviously that's important. In China itself, there's been big growth in various uh, sporting horse disciplines. So they are getting more and more active in the various sporting horse disciplines. So uh, they're quite important and a, a growing market. So yes, it's a, it is a concern. And obviously one wants to get onto it as quickly as possible and stop it spreading. And then uh, obviously, hopefully get it eliminated from that area as quickly as possible. Is that, uh, is that possible? I mean, the way you see it, um, can they bring it under control? Well, uh, yeah, and if you look at the previous outbreaks that have occurred outside of Africa, uh, the most recent one was obviously the Spanish outbreak, for, uh, well, it was, uh, Spain, Portugal, and Morocco, which started in Spain in 1987, and which they finally got under control in 1990. So that was transmitted or uh, in Spain, uh, you know, the first year and then three subsequent years. So it overwintered three, three winters, but that was right down in the south of Spain where it over, overwintered. Obviously, Spain has a very large horse population. If you think of, uh, and in Morocco itself, Morocco, uh, it only got in in, in 89 and uh, they, they vaccinated a lot of horses in 89. And then in 1990, they vaccinated every single uh, uh, horse, donkey, and mule in Morocco. There was excess of a million animals that were vaccinated. Portugal also vaccinated every single animal in Portugal. Uh, so yes, it's going to be interesting to see how we go forward and how uh, it is controlled. I think the key to it, you know, the I I think you're going to have almost year-round activity of midges. So we can't rely on, uh, 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 as we do in this country, our, our frost time of the year to uh, knock it back. We, they're going to have to look at some very serious control measures um, to actually uh, get rid of the virus in the, in the country. Let's go back to South Africa now. Um, it's our whole sickness time of year, our peak season. And uh, how are we looking? Have the numbers been... How do they compare to, to previous years? Where have the outbreaks been? How are we looking this year? Uh, we've had an interesting year so far, Aidan. Started off a little earlier, but we had quite a mild uh, winter. Uh, we started getting first cases, uh, uh, some parts of the country in late November, early December. Uh, 
Kao Teng up this way. We had our first in January, our first cases in January. Uh, we've had basically uh, all the types this year except type 5. Up here, the major type that's been causing a problem is type 7. Last year, 8 was our biggest culprit. This year, and there were quite a few 7s last year, quite a few 9s. Uh, this year, we've had majority 7s, only a few 8s. Uh, 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 so they've swapped roles. we still got a few 9s around this year. Um, other parts of the country, uh, we've also had quite a few type 1s. We haven't had that, that many type 1s for a few years. So we've had type 1s up here. Uh, and then the Eastern Cape has continued with type 2. Uh, it's had type 2 circulating there for a few years. Interestingly enough, now suddenly KwaZulu-Natal has had quite a few type 2s. The other thing we've had is a hell of a lot of encephalosis. So we're probably getting uh, for, you know, for every horse sickness positive, we also get, we're getting other horses which are encephalosis positive. Also the other really interesting thing this year, uh, as far as pyroplasmosis and any uh, uh, disease which causes a, a temperature, so pyroplasmosis is one of them. Pyroplasmosis cases we started getting as early as September last year. And so it is quite amazing. It was a lot earlier. We don't normally expect them until uh, November, December of each year. So yeah, I, I think it's possibly something to do with our milder winter. Um, so yes, you've got all, all three of those agents are, are, are circulating and are causing uh, issues on uh, farms in, or in, with horses uh, quite a lot of places. I know on um, yesterday when uh, we ran some samples, we had uh, nine horses positive horse sickness. Of those nine, three also had encephalosis. So they had the double whammy. Take us through the, you talk about type one, type two, how many types, you're talking about the serotypes. Um, what are yeah, the differences yeah. between them? Um, and if you just take us through those, those, those nine serotypes and how they present. Well, basically, African horse sickness has the nine serotypes. And more recently, we, we're calling them types because the testing we used to do was on a serum sample. So we did serotyping to get the result. Nowadays, we're using molecular typing. So it's more correct just to call it the type. Uh, so there are nine different, essentially, variations of the virus. You put virulent field virus of any one of those nine types into horses. And you get a variation in the clinical signs. So if we look at the outbreaks where you've had a point introduction of African horse sickness into an area. So if we exclude the issues we had in the Cape from 2004 through to 2016 with the, uh, with the vaccine virus. But in uh, 1999, we got type 7 down into Stellenbosch area. Uh, then in 2005, we had type 5 uh, in the uh, Wilderness George Neisner area. 2006, we had type 9 in the Robertson area. And essentially, even though you've got a single introdu or an introduction of a single type, and obviously it probably, well, we know in uh, the case of Stellenbosch, and in the case of Robertson, we actually know which individual horse brought that virus into the area. So it was one single horse that moved and brought it in. And um, then you get <coughs> clinical signs <laughs> in the different horses. So you get the whole range. You know, we talk about the Dinkop, the Dukkop, and the mixed form, and then the horse sickness fever. You actually get the whole range. And in fact, that is due to the specific horse's uh, uh, reaction to the African horse sickness virus. So the differences you see in clinical sign is not due to the type of the virus. It's due to how your particular horse responds to African horse sickness virus. So it's an individual animal uh, response. Right. And uh, isn't it, you talk about encephalosis as well. What exactly for the layman is encephalosis? How does that compare? Is that the same family of disease? And what are the, what are the symptoms? 
Well, encephalosis is actually uh, a very close relative to African horse sickness. It's also an Orbi virus. It's also transmitted by culicoides midges. But the vast majority of animals only show a mild temperature reaction. They may get swelling above the eyes in some cases, not all cases. And I know we had, uh, there was an outbreak a few years ago at one of my people who was busy with a project on a stud farm down in the Western Cape. And they had, um, uh, at that time, just under 100 foals on that stud. And of those, 93% actually showed indication that they were infected with encephalosis virus. But less than 50% of them even ever had a temperature. Okay, because they were measuring temperatures in all those horses. So you had a lot of the horses which were totally subclinically infected. You wouldn't have known they had been infected unless you'd done the tests on them later. So generally, it's a much milder uh, type infection, but obviously has some indications of horse sickness. So it's a differential diagnosis for African horse sickness. And uh, obviously, when you, when you do the test, and you see that your horse that's off its feed, got a bit of a temperature, got a bit of swelling, swelling above the eyes, that it's an encephalosis, not a horse sickness, you sleep a whole lot easier at night. Yeah. Can it be fatal? I mean, uh, if, it, if it runs it, rampant? Yes, it can. And what's interesting, we had an outbreak down in the Western Cape in 2007, where uh, we had uh, encephalosis, in fact, uh, one of the racing training yards uh, out of town in, in the Cape, uh, near Paul, had about 150 horses at the training uh, facility. And he actually had 12 horses which showed very, very severe clinical signs. And of those 12, uh, six died. Uh, there's also another uh, person who, uh, in that area, who trained horses. Uh, and they were in, um, you know, obviously in training for, uh, for racing. And they also lost four uh, uh, foals or four horses on their farm. Directly across the road from both of those farms were thoroughbred stud farms that had mares with foals on the farms. They were uh, running out. Yes, they had some horses with temperatures, but they had no severe cases. So there appears to be another factor that is playing a role in your severe cases. We suspect it may have something to do with high energy feed intake, which obviously horses in training would do that. Uh, you'd be on a, a very high energy ration. And so the clinical signs in horses on a high energy ration appear to be a lot more severe more of them show severe clinical signs than uh, uh, horses just running out and not on a high energy ration. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a, a case in 2008 in Robertson District where a person had uh, weanlings in, or sorry, yearlings in getting ready for the national yearling sale. Also being prepped for the sale, they're on a high energy diet. Uh, he had, in fact, one of those animals died, whereas the mares and weanlings running outside had some temperatures, but nothing else besides that. And I know I just, you know, my advice to the, that person was, look, while this is going on, just take away all concentrates, just feed your horses uh, uh, roughage and see what happens. And he saw no more serious cases. So it's maybe something to consider for people if it is in your area, um, maybe just back off on uh, concentrates with a high energy uh, until, they're, until they're over it. Why during this time of year, kind of January, February, do we see such a, a surge in, in general viruses? Why is that? What are the contributing factors? We just seem to see horses with puffy legs and, uh, and temperatures, and it's always during that time of year. Yeah. Well, Aiden, it's obviously all of these, whether we're talking pyro, we're talking horse sickness, we're talking encephalosis, and then obviously the others, West Nile, various other uh, viruses as well are transmitted by biting insects. So obviously as it gets warmer uh, and uh, uh, we, yeah, we've had a, a, enough rain, 
you suddenly get much more uh, 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 of the or biting insects, whether it's ticks or, or uh, midges for horse sickness and cephalosis or uh, mosquitoes for, um, uh, uh, for West Nile, and you get transmission of those viruses. So it's just the environmental conditions make it so much easier. You've got so many more mosquitoes around, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and so, or so many more insects around that can transmit these diseases. Let's uh, for the layman talk about horse sickness um, and and the whole the whole makeup of it. So we know that zebras, donkeys, but mostly zebras. We don't want to give them a bad reputation, but are what we call the 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 reservoir host. What does that yeah. mean? How long do they harbour the um, the viremia? And if you could explain that term as well in in layman's terms, um, and and how does it all come to be basically what what is the okay. whole makeup of the disease how, 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 how does it work yeah, yeah. okay so um all right african horse sickness virus uh the the what what the what <coughs> sorry <laughs> a little uh, uh tickle in the throat right. african horse sickness virus uh is basically transmitted from one horse to another by little by biting midges, culicoides midges, which are less than two millimeters in size, little tiny micro flying syringes. And they have to bite an infected animal to get infected themselves. Uh, and then it takes about up to 14 days, depending and also depends on temperature for them to actually uh, replicate the virus and be in a position to transmit it in their saliva. So the female midges actually need to have a blood meal so that their eggs can mature and they can go and lay eggs. So they, before they lay eggs, they go and look for uh, a, a, a mammalian host that they can go and feed on so they can then produce uh, a, a batch of eggs. The virus itself in a mammalian host that is infected, uh, the host will become infected, will replicate the virus, and it doesn't matter whether it is a horse, a donkey, a zebra, uh, a mule. Afterwards, depending on clinical signs, if they show severe clinical signs, they could well die, but if they survive, they develop a neutralizing antibody response to the virus and they eliminate the virus from their body. So it doesn't matter which one of the equid species it is, they get infected, they respond to the virus, uh, they may show severe clinical signs or they may show, in the case of zebra, very little clinical signs, if any, so they are basically totally subclinical and then they listen to immune response and they clear themselves of the virus. So I know I've had a, a, quite a few people and they, they uh, and I noticed uh, Aiden's obviously picked up on that. They use the term that uh, zebras are carriers and uh, I am not very uh, polite to them when they say that. There is no mammalian host species that can be a carrier of any one of the orbiviruses. So we're talking about African horse sickness, equine encephalosis, uh, blue tongue virus, and episodic hemorrhagic disease of, uh, of, of, um, of deer. Uh, so none of those can you get a, um, a carrier state. So in all of those animals, they all clear the virus and then, um, uh, you know, with the immune response. Um, so what you actually have is with these animals, if you've got a large enough population of animals that live in an area where you've got year-round activity of the vectors and non-seasonal breeding, so our tropical areas, for example, or the subtropical areas. So a prime example and where the work's been done is in the Kruger National Park 
uh, in South Africa, where we have a large population of zebras, somewhere between 30 and 50,000 zebras, depending on how good a season or bad a season it is, that they breed non-seasonally, so you'll see zebra foals all year round in the Kruger Park, and the midges are active all year round, as we know. Whenever we go to the Kruger Park, doesn't matter what month it is, you always take the mosquito spray because there are chances of mosquitoes being around. So um, in that sort of a case, we have what we call a reservoir, where you have constant circulation of the virus between or in that large population. And the important animals in that are your young foals, which are being born. Because when they're born, they get the uh, colostral antibody from their mother, but that disappears between four and six months of age. And then if you've got this virus circulating and you've got these new young animals, they're being infected and they're continuing that circulation. But if we have a look at both zebras and African donkeys, um, you know, if we look at the total population of, of zebras in Africa, it's about 700,000 zebras. But they are limited to uh, Southern Africa, so Namibia, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, up, through, um, uh, up as far as Kenya. But it, they don't go across into, the, into North Africa. If we go and have a look at donkeys in that same area where we've got 700,000 uh, uh, zebras, we've got 1.3 million donkeys. If you go across the Sahel of Africa, where you've got no zebra, in fact, there they have about 5 million donkeys. So the African donkey and the zebra actually play the same role. Unfortunately, no one's ever done the study to prove that the donkeys do exactly what zebra do. But if you think of it in, you know, going, if we go through Limpopo up into, across into Botswana or up into Zimbabwe, for every horse, I don't know how many, how many donkeys, we probably in some areas, we're up to more than 100 donkeys per horse. So in that area, I suspect that the donkeys are actually playing the role of the reservoir. And if we go across through Ethiopia and across into the further other Northern African countries where you've got no zebras, the reservoir host has got to be the donkey. There's nothing else that can be the uh, reservoir host in those countries. Mm. So what you're saying is that in, in certain areas, Kruger and north of us, the virus is active all year round. The midges are active all year round. When our conditions in the high field become right, these little midges are biting on the, the hosts and they are riding the thermals or riding the winds into our area or biting animals along the way, then more are biting and then they infiltrate the high felt and that's when we have the problem. When the cooler temperatures come, it puts to bed all of those, all of that, that issue. Yes, that's the 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 main focus or the main way it happens, all right? I, I do believe it's probably the, it's more, or the, the our outbreaks in the high felt are more actually associated with horses moving, okay? Okay. As I, as I mentioned, you know, we had the outbreak in Robertson in, um, in 2005. That was a horse which came up to the Horses of the Year show, okay, in February. And yes, he had been vaccinated, but only once previously. He came to the Horse of the Year show. He went back to the stud farm where he, he grew up. And he showed no clinical signs of horse sickness. But the poor old teaser stallion who lived outside in a, a little paddock like poor, most teasers do on the, on the stud farms, he got bitten by an infected midge and then he showed clinical signs, and then we had cases all around there. But when we went back to those horses that had gone to the, um, to the Horse of the Year show um, uh, that year, we actually got blood samples off one of them. We happened to be dealing with type 5, and type 5 is not in the OBP vaccine. It relies on cross-protection from type 8. And we could actually show that this one horse had an absolutely sky-high titer antibody titer for type 5. 
So he was the horse who actually brought that type five into that area. We could unequivocally say that's how it got there. So and we know from work we've done at Ornestapur, where we can show that in vaccinated horses, we have up to uh, 8% of those horses, which can become subclinically infected with African horse sickness. If you move them from one place to another, they can infect midges. So whether it's horses, whether it's donkeys, whether it's zebras, you're moving those animals around. So your, your way to protect your animals is to make sure that you have a good immune barrier and your animals are well vaccinated. Unfortunately, um, just like we have some of our neighbors who never ever burn fire breaks, we have some of our neighbors who, for whatever reason, decide they're not gonna vaccinate their horses because they don't believe in it or whatever other reason. And you then got, and I talk about like a felt fire. You know, you got a neighbor who hasn't burnt his, uh, uh, his uh, 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 fire breaks and a fire break, uh, uh, starts on his property. You got your neighbor who hasn't vaccinated his horses, brings in new horses, and bang, off it goes on his farm. Now you've got a massive felt fire on your neighbor's property. And so it can spill over onto your property because the midges can fly that distance. So, uh, yeah, the midges, if you look, there is work which can show that when um, uh, wind blown midges can go quite a long way over water. However, being so small, as soon as they get caught up in a wind uh, over land, they get blown into trees or into buildings or whatever, and obviously they don't survive very easily. But over water, where you've got laminar flow, um, they can be blown uh, a much further distance. Uh, and you know, we, the midges, being so small and fragile, as soon as the wind comes up slightly, they just head to ground. So. The days, you won't catch midges on a windy night, but on a still night, you'll catch a whole, you know, absolute millions of them. So, yeah, they, yeah. they, they look after themselves. They don't want to be blown in, into, uh, uh, yeah. into trees and buildings. Yeah. yeah. So far more likely that it's the movement of horses. Tell me about the or vaccine. Animals. Yeah. Tell me about the vaccine that, uh, that you guys have. Um, when was it developed? You talked about the cross strands. There are some strands that don't have protection. They rely on cross immunity. How far since the development of the vaccine have we come to where we are today? How has it progressed? Oh. All right. The first vaccine um, was actually developed in the 1930s. And that was by a group of researchers at Honest to Port, uh, headed by Alexander. Uh, but the pioneering work was actually done by Sir Arnold Tyler, starting as early as uh, the early 1900s. And he tried various things, but the first vaccine that was produced commercially for use uh, was uh, in the 1930s. And early in the 1940s, they then they'd identified seven different types of African horse sickness, and the vaccine was a polyvalent vaccine containing seven types used to be made uh, in mice, and they, uh, so they had mice colonies that they'd grow the virus in and then harvest the, uh, uh, the, the virus for the vaccine. Um, you had to passage that thing, so you put it from one mouse to another mouse to another mouse many times, in fact, up to 100 times, to get it to be attenuated. And what we mean by attenuated is in our field viruses, which are basically circulating uh, horse or other equid, midge back into equids, are the virulent field viruses. And what you do by attenuation is you adapt them to another host system, like mice, and you're basically making them less potent. So that they don't, they, they're causing an immune response but they're not causing disease. And so that's how our vaccine started initially. So that is now 90 years ago that we had the first vaccines that we could start using in horses. Then in the 1960s, um, the, the production systems 
were, they were quite difficult. And there were new systems coming online where you could actually grow these viruses on tissue culture. So Baltus Erasmus actually was the person who pioneered growing of uh, African ore sickness virus on tissue culture. And essentially by um, the end or early 70s, he'd gone in and uh, adapted all, ni all nine uh, types of African horse sickness virus to tissue culture and made the tissue culture attenuated vaccine strains. So the last of the tissue culture vaccine strains was included in the vaccine in the late 1980s. And it's what we've been using for the last 40 odd years. Um, uh, and there are quite a few differences between the old vaccine and new vaccine. Obviously, we got the mice to get the virus out. You'd harvest the organs and you'd munch them up and you'd put a bit of soup with it and you'd have this really interesting brew, which you'd then uh, 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 sort of uh, um, evaporate down and then make your vaccine from. So besides having the virus in there, it had a lot of mouse protein in it. Mm. So it was quite reactive and the horses reacted quite a lot to that mouse protein. And again, some horses were worse than others. So you get fairly severe reactions around the injection site. And then some horses would develop uh, a response, an almost immune response against this mouse antigen. So it's almost a, a type of a, uh, a fighting the, the mouse that you, you're injecting into them. So if we look you know, about people saying, oh, you must give your horses time off after horse sickness vaccine, that's where that came from. Yes, you could get some animals that obviously got a, um, a, um, uh, uh, a reaction to the virus itself and could have cl developed clinical signs. But a lot, most of the vaccine reactions were actually reactions to the vaccine itself and not to, uh, 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 to the mouse uh, uh, proteins in the vaccine, not the vaccine itself. So that's where people started saying, well, mice, give your horses the two week or the week off, the second week off from African horse sickness, uh, after you've done African horse sickness. The newer vaccine the mouse, uh, the, the tissue culture attenuated vaccine is a lot less reactive than the old vaccine. So, yes, you do get vaccine reactions, but that is generally in first time vaccinates. So, either weanlings, the very first time you give them, or, and some people uh, uh, forget this, imported horses, and obviously the sporting horses being imported, you need to be very sure that the first time you vaccinate, you take it easy. Once they've had uh, probably uh, three shots or three uh, uh, sets of uh, bottle one, bottle two, the chances of seeing a vaccine reaction are basically zero. So if you've vaccinated your animal more than three times, your chances of reaction are extremely small. And yeah, nowadays I think a lot of people say, well, we, we're taking off for, Africa, uh, for horse sickness vaccination. And it's more a time to give their staff a bit of a rest than you actually need for the uh, actual vaccine. And if you think in yeah. the racing yards, where we, um, you know, you, you quite often find that a, a horse suddenly does well in a race, now it qualifies for another race, but oops, its horse sickness is going to be out of sync. They actually go ahead and they vaccinate those horses in full training for racing and obviously watch it and see if it hasn't got any uh, un, untoward reactions but carry on training right the way through it. So, um, you know, it's not that necessary to actually back off your horses for that time unless you want to give your staff and yourself a bit of a holiday. So you say, because I wanted to use this chat to just debunk a few of those myths like um, uh, the second week. So you're saying with complete certainty, if you have a, a, an older horse that's had multiple injections, you can safely ride it right through those three weeks Yes. Carry on as you were, jump it without a kick. Without it, well, without worrying. You need to watch it. Obviously, it has yes. been any vaccine. If you have the horse showing you that it's, it's off color, it's not eating, uh, uh, it's not itself, back off it. But if it's yes. not, you carry on and you, you can carry on work as usual.
There's if, no, if your management is there, you're right, you're taking temperatures every day, your yeah, temperatures are normal, carry on yeah. as normal. As now, normal. the three-week break, they say you have to have the three-week breaks. What is that for? And what happens if you a little bit scatterbrained and now you vaccinate your second, your second injection a little bit too early? What, what are the complications? Yeah, the problem is like, all right, when you're putting in the vaccine, what you actually get, the, the animal, you expose any, well, any animal or human exposed to a virus, actually the, uh, has a reaction where they uh, produce a substance called interferon, which actually interferes with the growth patterns of the virus. So in fact, with African horse sickness virus and the vaccine, the, way, the reason you're waiting for three weeks is you're actually waiting for that interferon response to actually disappear. Okay, so hang on a second, Aiden. I just need to, wait. Okay, sorry, I just. No problem. <laughs> we'll have to break. We've got dogs that need to have dinner and right. people who, who need to walk past me to get there, but we made a plan. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. No problem. You, the beauty of being able to cut. Okay. Um, so, all right. Uh, we were with interferon. Uh, so, should, yeah. should I go back and start at the beginning? Okay. So, you, you've given the first injection, and now the three weeks they're producing the interferon, and you explain. Well, they, basically, what they do is when they're first exposed to it, they produce the interferon. And you need to wait for that to actually clear from the system before you give the next dose. So basically what it is, is if you give it too close, you're, because of interferon still circulating, you may not get as good an immune response as you would if you gave it three weeks or longer apart. Okay. Now, uh, Professor, um, a lot of people are saying as well, some people suggest, should I rephrase that, that it's better to give the second batch as batch number one. Why would they say that and what are the benefits? All right. If you have a look and there's good published data on it uh, in, the, in the veterinary literature where you give either bottle one or bottle two, uh, you get some horses where you get replication of the viruses in that horse. And the viruses in bottle one tend to replicate more than the viruses in bottle two. If you, so if you give bottle one, you can quite often see some of those viruses replicating, and then you give bottle two on top of that, you can have uh, the reaction getting worsened when you give that the, the, the three weeks later. Whereas if you swap the two around, you're giving bottle two first, you don't get nearly as many or nearly as much replication of the viruses in bottle two. And when you come back and give bottle one after it, because they've seen African horse sickness before it, uh, before, it does not replicate nearly as much. So you, well, I look at it and say bottle one appears to be more reactive in that you get uh, replication of the virus than bottle two. If you swap them around, you get less uh, replication bottle one, but by the time you give bottle two, the horse says, ah, oh, I know I'm dealing with African horse sickness, so you don't get as much replication of those bottle one viruses. So, yes, um, obviously, uh, for first-time vaccinates, I strongly recommend that people always give bottle two before bottle one, because you get less vaccine reactions. We've also gone in and looked at the antibody responses, and the antibody responses uh, 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 four weeks after the second bottle are exactly the same, whether you give bottle two, then bottle one, or bottle one, and then bottle two. So you're, gonna, you're getting the same response, but you're reducing your chances of having vaccine uh, reactions, particularly in your first time vaccine. In your older horses had vaccine many years in a row, it probably doesn't make a difference. But I, yeah, it's something if you, you wanna be careful with your first time vaccinates, 
I would strongly recommend one considered. Why, why not just then swap the labels around and make <laughs> two number one? <laughs> well, it's a bit more difficult than that because the, it's registered that way. And uh, uh, when you go back to registration authorities and you say, we want to do this. So yes, it's one of those things that uh, uh, it's uh, to change things off the fact is uh, 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 a little bit of an administrative nightmare. So rather just put it into practice and do the job. Yeah. Other myths that circulate is that the, the vaccine, if you work them on the vaccine, you can cause a heart murmur or heart arrhythmia. Any, tr any truth to that? Well, it's basically if you have replicating African horse sickness virus in a horse, one of the places that it does cause some damage is endothelial cells, so the cells lining blood vessels and this, the endothelial cells within the heart. So you, you can get uh, replication in those cells. And if it is in those cells and you stress that animal, you basically, is, you, 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 you can be causing additional uh, uh, damage to that heart tissue because it, it, it is not in a state to be working at full capacity. So, um, Need to be a, li a little careful with that if you actually have a horse that has got uh, replicating African horse sickness uh, in it at that time. So uh, that's where that comes from. If you take a horse that has had you know, African horse sickness itself, you, know, you don't go and exercise that horse for at least six weeks after it's finished showing clinical signs. You know, the, the damage to the, end of, uh, the endothelial cells in the heart is quite severe in, in those cases. And so it's, it's, it's almost bordering on a, uh, I would, wouldn't say a heart attack, but you've got you know, severe damage there that you need to give that horse at least six weeks, maybe even eight weeks off before you even bring that horse back if he's had horse. Talked about sport horses being imported and getting vaccinated for the first time. A lot of people uh, vaccinate twice in that one season. Is that something that's recommended or is that overkill? No, I think that is, that is the right way to do it. If you look at young horses, you know, uh, weanlings, if you take uh, um, you know, recommendations for foals born in this country, you want to vaccinate them as a weanling at about between six and nine months of age. And then again, uh, as a yearling, so that by the time they go into their uh, second horse sickness season, you can't avoid the first one. They're born into the first one and they've got to survive on the, uh, maternal, uh, uh, on the maternal immunity from the colostrum. But going into the second season, it's strongly advised that they've had at least two full sets of uh, vaccines going into that second season. It just makes the immunity is that much better. And obviously if you've got a um, imported horse, so the same thing, most imported horses coming in through uh, you know, Johannesburg quarantine station, they will actually receive uh, uh, African horse sickness vaccine whilst in quarantine if the owners wish them to get it. And there they will get uh, obviously bottle two first, then bottle one. And you can go straight back uh, and I, I normally recommend in those cases, in fact, you, you, you don't go three, week, three weeks, you go four weeks in between. And then you come back four weeks later and you give you know, the bottles again. So you can go you know, bottle two, bottle one, four weeks later, bottle two, four weeks later, bottle one. And then, so within a period of 12 weeks, your horse has actually had two full sets of vaccine and is then uh, much better prepared for the next season of horse sickness when, uh, if it's exposed. There's been a move to have everybody comply to have their horses vaccinated by the end of October, I think it is. It's been a little bit of resistance uh, towards that from the sport horse community because it's around the time of Derby. People don't want to interrupt their, their training schedules, their show schedules. We've debunked the myth that that you can't work in the second week, so really you can carry on, especially in the older horses. But the second resistance to that is that a lot of people still believe that, well, the height of the disease is, time is now March, April, May, and if I give it December time, 
then they're going to have a stronger immunity to the disease come the height of horse sickness. Is there any truth to that? Or is it, you, will your horse have the same immunity to it given the vaccine if you give it in kind of August, September, October to December, given that with the height of the horse sickness season is March, April? Yeah. All right. Let's get to why that recommendation. Okay. So essentially that the work we did in the Cape where we showed that we were getting transmission of vaccine virus or we had transmission of vaccine virus between horses in 2004, 2011, 2014, 2016. And what, what happened there is you had people vaccinating horses in the summer months. So probably December, January, uh, they were vaccinated their horses. You had some of those horses, obviously first time vaccinates, and you had the horses replicating the virus. And then midges picked up that virus and transmitted the virus. So, you know, the, the uh, controlled area in the Western Cape, we've had one outbreak there that was caused by a horse moving in, and that was in 1999. And all the other outbreaks have actually been due to us using vaccine in that area. But there's a big difference between that area and where we live, in that you have a large proportion of the horses in that area that have never been vaccinated in their lives. Okay, So you had these susceptible other horses in the area where the midges could be transmitting to those horses. So if you take now in the Western Cape uh, or in the controlled area, you have to, well, you've always had to ask for permission to vaccinate. They will only give people permission to vaccinate their horses from beginning of June to end of October. So they're not vaccinating into the time of the year when you have your peak of your vector activity. So essentially the recommendation is for regular use, get your horses vaccinated, and um, don't vaccinate during the peak season uh, if you can avoid it. However, um, it's a recommendation. It's not saying you can't do it. And I've had some heated arguments with people about it because it's an individual uh, consideration for an individual patient. So if you have, and we had quite serious horse sickness outbreaks, Pretoria, uh, last year. And there were some people who had very valuable foals, which had never been vaccinated. And they were sitting between four and six months of age. And they stood to lose a large amount of value in animals then dying to African horse sickness. You then have to look at this. You say, look, on my farm, all my mares, all my yearlings, all my older horses are already vaccinated, but I've got this valuable fall crop that I need to protect. I've got neighbors who are having cases and their horses dying around me. I believe that you as a horse owner can consult with your veterinarian and you can make that decision and go ahead and do it. But it's on an individual uh, case basis on justifying doing it. So, you know, people say, well, never vaccinated in the face of an outbreak. Well, I can tell you, Thailand are vaccinating in the face of an outbreak. They don't do it. They're, gonna, they're not going to stop the outbreak. Okay. So, you, if you don't have to, you don't, you don't do it. But if you've got circumstances around you, need to protect animals, there's no reason not to, to actually vaccinate individual animals. If you take, also, if you say to people, okay, fine, if you're going to do that, make sure you've got your horses being stabled and you've got screens around them. So midges aren't actually getting into them to be able to pick up virus from them if they replicate it and transmit it to other horses. So there are other ways of also dealing with it and basically reducing the risks associated. But again, in this part of the world, the vast majority of horses are vaccinated anyway. So you know, we would not really 
see it like we saw in the Cape where you had large numbers of horses not vaccinated ever. So that meant you could transmit that virus very easily to those other horses. Mm. So what you're saying is you could vaccinate a horse, a midge could bite a horse that had been vaccinated, pick up the viremia from the vaccine and transmit it to another horse and you could have a full blown case of horse sickness that came from a horse that was vaccinated. Well, that's what we saw in the Cape. Okay. Yeah. In, and again, yeah, it's very difficult to say what we're seeing up here. Okay. Because in the Cape, yes, we knew that the, you know, we, we could never work out where the, the case is from. We had these outbreaks. We could never work out where the virus came from. So we did the genetics on those viruses and showed that all the viruses associated with 2004, 2011, 2014, 2016 outbreaks came straight out of the vaccine bottle. Okay. There was no field virus associated with it. Whereas up here, where you've got circulating field virus, the, the chances are that you could, and this is where the other risk comes in, if you're vaccinating horses during the middle of an outbreak, you may have a horse infected with a field virus at the same time. Yeah. And then you can get other reassortants coming out of it. So if you're going to do it, you need to look at the reducing the risks of having a field virus then becoming associated or re reassorting with your, your vaccine virus. So, you know, it's a, it's a thing to keep in the back of the mind, but at the same time, the vast majority of our horses are vaccinated. So the, the potential risks are infinitely lower than they are in the Western Cape. Yeah. Back to my first part of that question. When, after vaccinating your horse, is its immunity against the disease strongest? The, What's the time frame? The immunity peaks between three and six months after vaccination and then gradually declines up to, but it never declines to zero. It declines out to a year and they are still well protected a year out after vaccination. But the peak is three months. So if, you, if you're doing, uh, uh, having your horses done by end of October, November, December, January, and you have to peak between three and six months. So you are sitting there, you know, February, March, April, which are the big high point of the season. So if you try and get it done by the end of, uh, uh, end of October, you know you're going to be at your peak from end of January through to end of April into May. And you know, you, you're, covering, you're covering your bases because that is uh, the, best time, uh, the, the, the best immunity that horse is going to have. So best time, optimal time is around October is what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get them done. Yeah, I, I know uh, you, you said uh, something about uh, not riding. Yes, I, uh, I don't ride very often, but I do have one or two uh, horses that uh, 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 eat more than they should uh, running around here. And when they, they get done, uh, we do them uh, early in October and end of October. And that's when I do my horse and my donkey. Now, some strains are, are more deadly than other strains, but a lot of the time when horses get horse sickness, they, they're not, they can only get the, the pulmonary one or the cardi or the heart one, but most often it's both. Most often it's a combination of both. Is that correct? Yeah, well, yeah, particularly in your vaccinated horses, okay? Uh, if you go into a naive population where you have, if you look at what's happening in Thailand at the moment, Okay, where well, you've had a virus put in totally new into horses that have never seen vaccine in their lives. They are seeing all of the typical forms. So you're seeing the cardiac form, the uh, pulmonary form, and the mixed form. That, that's what they're reporting that they're seeing uh, in Thailand. So where we've had the outbreaks you know, in the Western Cape, you see the same thing. Okay, you see the, the, all three of them. Yeah, however, because you've got that many more or that a high proportion of your horses vaccinated. The vast majority are, in fact, mixed to the cup form. Okay. However, you've got to remember, and this is the other variable that happens with African horse sickness. Just like there's some people, when you go somewhere where there are mosquitoes, there's some people who are carried away by the mosquitoes, 
And there are other people who the mosquitoes say, uh-uh, he doesn't taste so good. We don't want to go and munch on him, okay? Mm. Same happens with horses, okay? You've got some horses which are very attractive to midges and other horses which are not at all attractive to, uh, to midges. So you actually end up, and this is the part of the equation that some people uh, miss sometimes, is that if your horse happens to be very attractive, it can be bitten by millions of midges. Whereas a horse that's not so attractive gets bitten by one or two. So if out of those millions of midges, you've got one in a few thousand that are infected, you could actually have that horse being uh, uh, getting multiple infective doses from midges at the same time. Do you sometimes get a horse that has been vaccinated for many years and for whatever reason, gets a really severe case of African horse. I would suggest that in those cases, it's because that animal has been uh, actually infected by multiple infected midges at a similar sort of time. So in mm -hmm. fact, it's like a massive bushfire. It's not a felt fire, it's a bushfire. And yeah. Yeah, the immune state, the immune status, there's just so much virus there, it can't actually get it neutralized quickly enough. So yeah. I think that is a factor that plays a role sometimes. So, um, you know, you, you, you try to do your best and that's why you do all the other things like your, uh, your, your uh, uh, repellents and your screens and those sort of things to reduce your attack rate on uh, your horses, uh, your, your chances of them, uh, their systems being overwhelmed or reduced even further. Is in an unvaccinated horse, is a bite from one infected midge enough to give that horse a, a horse sickness? Yes. One flying micro syringe is enough to kill a horse. Yeah. In fact, one infected midge is enough to kill a horse. Yeah. That's the frightening thing about it. Yeah. Um, Social media can be a positive thing, can be a very dangerous thing. There are lots of groups on the subject out there, and there seems to be a lot of misinformation. Um, a lot of people choose to stable their horses. Well, when they don't stable their horses. They keep their horses outside in densely populated horse areas, which to me seems a pretty selfish thing to do because you're putting everybody else at risk because if one of those horses gets horse sickness or the herd gets horse sickness, those midges, you increase the horse, the, 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 the midge population of infected midges becomes that much stronger. So what would your, what would your advice be to people who are still believing that they want to go the natural route and keep their horses outside because they say, well, my horses are vaccinated. They're fine. What are the implications? <laughs> Yeah. Look, uh, and I, uh, yeah, and that that's basically what you you're doing is if you 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 increasing the viral load in the midge population. Okay. And yes, your horses may be surviving, um, and their immunity may be good enough, so it's protecting them. But you are getting more and more virus into the population into the midge population. And you can reach a tipping point where suddenly it's not just a felt fire, it's a bushfire. And then you're in big trouble. So you, know, you, you get one or two serious cases and particularly you know, your young horses, which you know, their immune status is not so good. So you're, you're mares with a foal, okay? And again, we, we talk about the maternal immunity get, going through to the foals, which actually starts waning um, uh, and it depends on how much of each of the specific antibodies to each of the types that the mare actually put into her colostrum. And it varies from mare to mare. So you may get some mares that for whatever reason, they don't put much antibody to, let's say, type 1 into their colostrum. So that fold is born. It has that colostrum and it doesn't get a very good protection against type one. If type one uh, 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 happens to be circulating in that area, that antibody is lost and it may be lost within two months. So that from two months of age, that fold is then fully susceptible to type one. Okay. 
And if type one happens to be circulating, bang, in it goes and that foal dies. So you quite often see, if you think where uh, African horse sickness gets onto farms where people have got young foals, you may have one or two young foals which show clinical signs and die. Okay, but I suspect those are the ones that happen to have got low colostral immunity from their mothers. Okay, but again, that one horse getting full-blown African horse sickness with those huge uh, amounts of virus that are in that horse, then just can infect millions of midges. So you know, then taking it from a felt fire to a bush fire. And obviously you can have, you, 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 you uh, are uh, aggravating the whole situation. So, yeah, it does. I do believe if you are, if you can, it makes most sense to, uh, 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 to put your horses in a stable. I know uh, we also at home uh, on our horses, we put uh, repellents on all our horses every night. The only animal that doesn't get sprayed with the repellent every night is the donkey because it is immunized, it's vaccinated. But obviously, if the midges are really wanting to find something, well, they can go and bite the donkey. But then again, the flip side of that coin is if they bite the donkey, they get the disease, they could bite the horses, but your horses have got the repellent on. Ellen, yeah. um, and our donkey's vaccinated as well. All right. He's How... vaccinated. <laughs> How much of a protection does the vaccine give? In other words, is it, it's, is it fail safe or is there a percentage um, as, to, as to what protection it will offer a horse? Say a horse that's been vaccinated, obviously the more times you get it, the, 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 the stronger the immunity becomes, but say a horse yeah. that's been vaccinated five years, how confident can you be that you are protected? I'd say that if a horse has had a minimum of three full sets of vaccine, 95% of those horses will be fully protected 95% of the time. Okay. So there is no vaccine, veterinary vaccine or human vaccine that has ever been made that is 100% effective 100% of the time. Okay. With African horse sickness, it's even more complicated because we're not talking one vaccine. Mm. We're talking actually a combination of nine vaccines at once. That because we're vaccinating against the nine types of African horse sickness. So it's more complex that if, if we're taking and we're just doing, let's say, uh, a smallpox vaccine where it's a single virus and that's it, and you, you, there's a single strain you're dealing with. But is, it is a little bit more complex than most other conditions because of the multiple strains. But if you take, you know, African horse sickness is one of the most devastating uh, viral infections out there. If we, not only to horses, if you take, you know, you take, um, you know, the outbreaks that if, if I look now in Thailand, okay, the one area there, they have had, uh, 100, 191 cases, 178 of those animals have died. So that you then have of the case fatality rate is in excess of 90% of the animals that, get that have been infected have died. If we look at Ebola in uh, West Africa in humans, Ebola, the case fatality rate was just over 50%. Okay. So if you're a horse, you say, please bring on Ebola. It's a wimp complete compared to horse sickness. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a really, it's, it's, it's a, it's a really lethal agent and the vaccine, it, well, and I have made the statement repeatedly, whenever we start talking vaccine, if you look before we had a vaccine in this for African horse sickness, Okay, there's a book, Memories of a Game Ranger by Harry Walleter, where he described how uh, they uh, basically opened up the Sabi Game Reserve, which then became the Kruger Park. They used to have remounts supplied to them because they did all their patrols on horseback. They used to have remounts supplied to them every four weeks during winter, 
and every two weeks during summer because the horses got nailed by a frequency. Okay. Cool. And yeah, you read other things from the Boer War. Okay. And I know there's, uh, 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 there's one of the Boer War generals, I think it was a, 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 or commanders, a, a, a ace, who is quoted as saying, you, you ride your horses into the Skirpoort Valley and you carry your saddles out. Okay. Well, no, no wonder Henning's made the move. <laughs> um, yeah. I believe, I believe that's part of the reason why Honest Support is set up where it is, because during the Boer War there was a remount post there, and all these horses kept dying, and they yeah. brought in some some doctors. Is there is there truth in that from from England well, or somewhere to do the research? No, 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 no. In fact, if you take Sir Arnold Tyler, who's essentially the 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 father of veterinary science in this country. So Arnold Tyler was actually employed as the first government bacteriologist with the Transvaal Republic. It was before the Union of South Africa days. So he was actually employed by the Transvaal Republic. And his first laboratory was out near Dustport, near the Dustport Tunnel in, in Pretoria. And then he actually was tasked, and essentially because of the Boer War, with trying to come up with solutions for uh, African horse sickness. And because, Af because horse sickness was so bad at on a support area, and yes, they did have a, a station there where they saw a lot of horses died, he actually moved his laboratories out to on a support in 1908 to basically answer African horse sickness. And obviously it wasn't too many years later that the first vaccine was developed. And obviously, yeah, and a, a, a statement, yeah, I make to people, if we take where we are today with our horse industry in this country today, if it wasn't for the vaccine that Alexander developed in the 1930s and the vaccine that was upgraded by uh, Baltus Erasmus in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s, we wouldn't have the horse industry we have today. Not saying the vaccine doesn't have any warts on it, but we wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't wasn't for that vaccine. In older horses, say 10, 11, 12 year olds that have been vaccinated every year, do is there any truth that you get to a point where they've got the immunity that you, you, it can't get any stronger, that there's really no point in vaccinating after that point? It, it's a contentious <laughs> question usually... because I, I don't want to lead people to believe that, oh, I don't need to vaccinate my horse anymore. But well, some people... Say, no, no, I, I'm just going to and I know uh, my wife's horse is, is actually is, is an imported horse. He, he was imported for racing from Australia. He's been vaccinated for many years, quite a few years now. And I know that I am never, ever going to say to my wife, no, well, I'm not going to vaccinate your horse because I think he's got enough. And then he gets all sickness. I know where I'd end up. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be deeper than the hole that we had to put the horse in. <laughs> now let's but talk about the... Really the, difficult one. Yeah. The export industry, Alan. This is a live vaccine. And what do we need to do to get the rest of the world to say, right, bring us your horses? that we don't have to go via Mauritius and quarantine and go through all this protocol. We'll get to the audit that's happening a little bit la later, but w what needs to happen to get the rest of the world taking away that it's a trade agreement as well, that we have to get other people, but what ha needs to happen in terms of vaccine or cure? Um, and if you, if you look at it and it is, yeah. And again, we were stuck, with uh, the outbreak in Thailand, at the moment, the only commercially available vaccines anywhere in the world. Okay, there's obviously ones from Honest to Put, but there are also other uh, uh, modified live virus vaccines available from other producers in Africa. One in Ethiopia, one in Senegal. They are all modified live virus vaccines. They're the only ones registered for use in horses anywhere in the world. So when you have an outbreak 
somewhere else in the world. The people say, to you, say we want a vaccine for a specific type and it must be registered for use in horses in, the con in the, at least the country where it's produced and maybe some other countries and have a track record. So right now, the vaccine that is being used in Thailand is actually bottle one from OBP because their, back, or their virus that has caused the problem is type one. And the OBP vaccine is the only type one or vaccine containing type one available commercially anywhere in the world. At the moment. There's been a lot of work done experimentally and a lot of other uh, approaches experimentally. None of those have actually gone beyond proof of concept at this stage. You've got proof of concept that you can get an immune response in horses. And in some cases, they've actually gone in and showed that if you uh, challenge horses with uh, uh, the specific type that you vaccinated against, you're protecting those horses. However, if we look particularly in South Africa, um, we have to have a vaccine that gives us polyvalent protection against all the types, okay? We've done some work looking at a new technology for vaccine where we've got exceptionally good data to show that we can protect against a single serotype. We don't have data to show we can give a polyvalent protection. So at this stage, from a South African perspective, in fact, you go to people and say, we've got the answer, we can give you a new vaccine, until such time as we can say, guys, we've got proof of concept that the system works, and we've got proof of concept that we can give polyvalent protection. Then it becomes a vision for South Africa to look at introducing new technologies. Does it mean that that's not a viable option for other parts of the world? No, it doesn't, okay? But if you take, and where, where are things gonna go from here in uh, Southeast Asia, okay? Um, and what happened with the Spanish, uh, Portugal and Morocco outbreak? With that, the modified live virus vaccines were used for the first two years of the outbreak and the last well, two and a bit years and the last year and a half, in fact, they used a killed type four vaccine to clean up the tail end of that outbreak. Is that gonna have to be applied in Southeast Asia? We don't know at this stage, okay? But obviously uh, that is where you're trying to clean up a single type at a time and uh, getting it uh, cleaned up. I do believe we will, the new vaccine technologies have developed very well. I think the chances of having a new technology uh, give us something is good. Um, but at the same time, we've got to make sure it's going to be protecting our horses as well as what we've got at the moment. Um, you know, the obviously the, the new technologies, the, uh, the costs associated with producing of those vaccines is quite a bit higher than the current vaccine. So the modified live virus vaccine is old technology, uh, but it's effective. So whatever you bring onto the table is going to not only need to be new technology, it needs to be equally effective or no less effective. Otherwise, it's actually probably not going to make, be able to make a difference in our country. So if you take from what's happened with Thailand, African horse sickness is a constant threat. And the rest of the world, particularly Europe and the USA, and you know, places like Hong Kong and Singapore say, we have huge investment, a huge industry, if something goes wrong, what insurance policy do we have that's going to help us clean up an outbreak? And they don't want to be using the modified live virus vaccine. So we're stuck between a, a bit of a rock and a hard place, but we need to make sure 
that whatever technology is available is going to be applicable in South Africa because it doesn't help us going ahead and making technologies which can only be used as a monovalent vaccine but will never give us polyvalent protection because then you're making a product which is there just for outbreaks. And yes, we had the you know, Middle East in the 1960s. We had Spain, Portugal, Morocco in the 1980s. And now in 2020, we've got Thailand. Uh, we don't need to be investing all our money into producing a product that's actually going to be uh, used in emergency. We need to know it can be used in the field on an ongoing basis. And if necessary, can be applied in emergency elsewhere. And yeah. at the moment, if you take the OBP vaccine in the emergency, that's the only one that is available. It basically, I don't believe, and I don't think there's many people who believe that the outbreak in Thailand would be able to be brought under control without vaccination. So you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. For, for the layman, Alan, if you can just explain polyvalent and monovalent. Okay. Monovalent is essentially... Uh, you've got one type, okay? So you make a vaccine against type one and you use it. And you, it's not a combination vaccine, so you don't have uh, all of them stimulating an immune response at the same time. You're putting one vaccine in against one particular type. Whereas polyvalent, because we have, and you know, this year we've had all the types circulating in South Africa except, uh, except type six, you know? So we have uh, almost every year, we have all nine circulating somewhere in our country. Um, so we're not at the end of the season yet. So type six may pop its head up somewhere. So we need to make sure our horses are protected against all types. And so the polyvalent vaccine is to actually protect against all types. Whereas in an outbreak situation, outside of uh, the endemic countries, you are invariably uh, dealing with a single type which gets introduced. Let's now talk about the OIE and the audit that was meant to happen before COVID uh, broke out. When was that meant to happen? What is the situation now? Because a lot of people are getting very excited about the prospect of once again being able to export horses from Cape Town straight into Europe. Is it as simple as that? We pass, we pass the audit, say we pass the audit. Is, is it as simple as that? What happens next? Well, well, yes and no. Okay, we had our horse sickness outbreak in 2011. And at that stage, uh, we had a protocol in place and we were exporting horses directly into the EU. So we had approval to export horses straight from Cape Town into the European Union. Uh, with the outbreak in 2011, that, that was suspended. So South Africa uh, is not off the list. It is suspended at the moment. So uh, to get the suspension lifted. There was an audit which was held in 2000 or early 2014. Um, there were some issues that the EU auditors raised. And just after that, we had the, uh, um, uh, the 2014 outbreak uh, uh, in the Western Cape. So obviously, they weren't going to lift the suspension because we'd gone another two years. So essentially, or we, we had another outbreak. So obviously, the issues that were highlighted by the EU have been very, very well addressed. And I think our systems are exceptionally good now to be able to have addressed all the issues that the EU raised. So I'm very confident that when they come and do an audit, that we will have ticked every single one of the important boxes. If an auditor can't find something wrong in an audit, they haven't done their job. So they will find one or two little things, I'm sure, and have room for improvement and obviously put things in place. Um, the auditors were meant to be here right now. Okay. <laughs> End of April, they were going to be here. So uh, we would have been going through that right at the moment. Obviously, with COVID, it has been uh, um, uh, uh, basically put on hold. I don't 
uh, know, or what at the moment, obviously, we don't know when our travel bans are going to be lifted in this country, when travel bans in Europe are going to be uh, lifted. But I suspect you know, that we may be looking later in the year. And then the auditors will come out and do their audit. And I am quite confident that they are not going to find any major issues. They will, if they do their work, they'll find one or two issues which we can uh, attend to. And then obviously it goes back to the um, European Commission and they decide on whether they should lift the suspension or not. So I would hope that that is going to be a positive outcome. I would be disappointed if it's not. If we, so, so let's, let's paint the picture. We pass the audit with flying colors. The OIE writes their report. They say pass. They then submit it to uh, the European Union. Um, it's up to each individual country then to decide for themselves whether to accept our horses or is that a given? Once that no. report is in, can they still say, well, you know, there was, a, there was an outbreak in Thailand or can they still say, well, we just don't feel we want to accept horses? Well, uh, uh, and, uh, yes and no. The actual, the audit is an EU audit. Okay. okay, it's actually auditors from the European Union. Okay, um, so when they accept and it goes back to the European Commission for the decision, because they, they, their report goes to the European Commission, and then they make a decision based on the, uh, uh, the audit report. And usually what they'll do is they'll write the report, they'll then send it to South Africa for comment, um, and see that South Africa is happy with what they do before they put it back to the uh, Commission for Decision. Obviously, if there are comments, uh, our veterinary authorities would do that, to then go for decision. If that decision is favorable, basically, from the day after that decision is made, we would be able to export horses from Cape Town directly into the European Union with its, uh, now probably, am I gonna make a mistake? It's now 27 member countries because the UK has now left the European Union. It used to be the 28 countries. So um, obviously the one country we are gonna have to negotiate with individually is now the UK. Because <laughs> not they will not be automatically part of the EU decision. Uh, but if you take, exports and the way that aircraft go uh, there are not many uh, cargo flights with upper deck capacity that fly uh, directly into and out of the uk so most of our horses actually go into continental europe obviously after that um, our other trading partners potential trading partners so if we look at the middle east and we're looking at the far east they will also be able to get hold of that uh, uh, audit report because it is a public document, and then they'll be able to make decisions on whether they will accept the horses directly into their countries or not. But so it's it's then more a it's more a, a domino effect. Will the other guys look at that report and say yes, we're happy, we're prepared to take the horses directly, um, or do they add a few extra layers on the outside? Mm. Um, but if you look at it, they're only, you know, the European Union has this whole audit team. The only other countries who really have a similar type of setup is the US. Uh, and most other countries in the world uh, actually go and look at, and it's not only for horses, it's for all uh, uh, animals and animal products, actually go and pull EU audits to see what the EU auditors have found. Uh, for them to be able to make their decisions on whether they should allow it or shouldn't allow it. So in most cases, they, they do. Uh, there's a, a lot of importance put on those um, EU audits. And once it's allowed, it'll still be a 30-day quarantine in Cape Town, fly direct to one of the European countries, and then a 30-day or 20-day quarantine or 40-day quarantine there before you're allowed out. Well, <laughs> yes and no, okay? If you take when we opened exports in 1997, uh, 
the first three horses that went out uh, were uh, London News, Trojan Hero, and Ruby was, Mountain. Ruby Mountain. There they are. Thank you very much, Aidan. <laughs> okay, and they flew straight into Amsterdam. Ruby Mountain went off to become the first South African qualifier in the uh, uh, Volvo World, World Cup, was it called then? Yep, that's okay. it. And London News and Trojan Hero got the next flight out of Amsterdam to Hong Kong. So they stayed in the Horse Hotel in Amsterdam and then went straight on to Hong Kong. So uh, that would be the ideal where the horses quarantine in Cape Town and then meet the requirements for entry into Europe and then no additional requirements for entry anywhere else. Um, obviously, since our suspension, the OIE code has changed a bit. And uh, the one thing that we don't know at this stage is the uh, whether the EU is going to uh, consider the shorter quarantine period and PCR testing instead of the long quarantine period with serological testing. At the moment, all our horses have always done 40 days with serological testing, but obviously the OIE has brought in the new clauses now for the 14 day with PCR testing, which obviously could change the ball game quite, uh, uh, quite uh, spectacularly. So I think uh, that'll be an interesting space to watch. Will we be able to use the new uh, protocol and reduce the quarantine period down to, uh, well, you, you won't do it exactly 14 days because you need to get the sample, test the sample and ship the horses. So I think you'd need to make sure that you got two or three days because all you'd need is to have the aircraft sitting in Cape Town and you've got a horse that doesn't comply and then you're, <laughs> you've got a, a problem. You would, wa you would want to make sure that you've got your test results before the aircraft arrives. Yeah. Um, Alan, there are also, again, going back to these social media groups, I do believe, I haven't heard, heard don't know exactly who the manufacturers are, but there are some people peddling, pushing alternate vaccines to the Honest Report vaccine. Uh, how yeah. dangerous is that? Um, what would your recommendation to people out there be? Right. The, there are other, there is a product which uh, is or has been available for a number of years from a company called Disease Control Africa that is not a registered product. So there has never been any dossier put forward to any regulatory authority uh, to look at the two most important things associated with any vaccine. One is safety and two is efficacy. So those have been used. They're, if you look at the technology being used, uh, it's meant to be a chemically killed uh, vaccine. Chemically killing of viruses uh, is a well-known uh, uh, procedure. It's widely applied. A lot of our other vaccines in horses are killed vaccines. However, there are and have been a number of problems associated with vaccines that have not been properly killed. So we've seen outbreaks of smallpox. We've seen outbreaks of polio. We've seen outbreaks of foot and mouth disease. And we actually have cases where you, it looks like African horse sickness virus has not been properly killed. And so there are questions about the safety of those products. But the problem is it's not a registered product, either under the uh, Medicines Control Act, 
which is Act 101, or under the Livestock Remedy Act. So we usually with a registered product or with any registered product, if there is an adverse drug reaction, you put in a report and the person who has the license or the registration holder is obliged to actually go in and investigate each one of those adverse drug reactions and to report back to the registration authority what the problem was, et cetera, et cetera. With unregistered product, or so, well, in fact, the way the product's been distributed is to call it a compounded product, and you are meant to get a veterinarian to write your prescription for you to use that in your particular animal. Uh, how do you recall a product like that if there is a problem uh, within that? At this stage, there's no mechanism to do it. Mm -hmm. So oversight of uh, whether you have the right safety and secondly, the efficacy is a major problem. Um, there are some other products which have been um, looked at and made elsewhere in the world. There's a product that uh, uh, they've been working on for a number of years in Dubai. Um, that product has been authorized for experimental use in Dubai, where they've been allowed to vaccinate some horses with it. They have not been allowed to do any challenge studies. They've only been allowed to vaccinate and see what immune responses you get. However, they've also got authorization in Kenya to use it experimentally on uh, some horses in Kenya, uh, but obviously also no challenge study. For that product to come into South Africa, and we've been in discussion with the people from Dubai, the first thing that's gonna be needed is we need the safety dossier. Safety dossier on that product, how it's made, and all the data on uh, the inactivation curves, uh, the safety in various test uh, systems have to be provided before the Medicines Control Council will even issue authorization to import it. Okay, at this stage, that dossier has not been made. So, in fact, if anyone, so if one wants to evaluate it, you know, even as a research institution at the moment, until I have that safety dossier, I can't even evaluate it on a research basis, let alone use it because they don't know the safety. So once they've looked at the safety, then they say, okay, fine, we've got a problem there, problem there, problem there, we need more data. Okay, so these are the conditions under which you can use it to collect the data to be able to fill in those holes. So that's where we're sitting at the moment. And the, 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 the procedure that needs to be followed is well documented. The people in Dubai have been uh, supplied with the documentation, and I don't believe they've actually taken it forward to actually make an application to uh, you know, bring it into the country. So it's, it's yeah, there's potential there, but obviously it needs to be looked at very carefully and uh, looked at how we take it forward. Well, they say every cloud has a silver lining and perhaps with the outbreak of Thailand, if it moves up and gets closer to China, Hong Kong, major racing territories where big money um, is at stake, maybe money is forthcoming towards more research. Um, final question to you, vaccine is different from cure. Do you think that a cure is out there? Aiden, I think yes, okay. Let's say rational therapy, okay. So if you've got a case, you can actually treat it rationally. The interesting thing about African horse sickness is that it's not the virus that kills the horse. It's the horse's reaction to the virus that kills itself. Okay. So it looks like, in some ways, there's some parallels between COVID and African yeah. horse sickness. Okay. That, and also Ebola, that you have... Uh, uh, what they, they term, and you may have seen it there, they call the cytokine storm, okay, mm -hmm. which is the 
inflammatory mediators. And I suspect that uh, with the work that's coming out now on Ebola and also probably with COVID, we'll start to understand more about cytokine storm. I wouldn't be at all surprised to find that that is what is at the center of African horses. And then that you could actually go in and have rational therapies to uh, uh, basically uh, stop the storm, okay, and be able to pull a horse through. At the moment, we don't know what the reasons are, and as I said, or what the, the specific causes are and how we can reverse it. And I know when people ask me about how do you treat African horse sickness, and I say to people, there are lots of uh, things that people suggest. Not many of them have any scientific uh, proof behind them, but I know that what I can recommend to people is if you have a case of African horse sickness, the one thing that you need to start doing immediately is start praying. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible disease. Alan, it's been highly informative, and I thank you so much. What we're going to take out of this for the, the riding community, a huge, huge amount, but please stable your horses. Um, don't leave them outside. It's way too risky. Do the, uh, the insecticides, do the repellents first and foremost, and uh, just keep them away. One, one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, they talk about stabling as, as that is the prevention number one. But it also comes down to management in terms of the stables themselves. Brick and mortar is best. Close the gaps. Put mesh, the right type of mesh, if you can put insecticides on that mesh as well. But what about people who are doing like deep litter beds, um, those tires that they put the buckets into so that the buckets don't fall over and the water spills out into those tires and creates kind of the perfect little breeding ground for these midges. Um, is that a risk as well? Does management need to change in those cases? Aiden, within the stable itself, the, the buckets with water, absolutely no problem with them, okay? The midges don't breed in puddles of water like mosquitoes, okay? So with your mosquitoes, those are a major problem. The midges breed in uh, damp soil, okay? So, and it needs to be actually soil with a uh, high um, uh, organic matter content as well that holds water well, okay? Because what they don't like, the immatures, the, the larval stages, if they dry out, they don't like it. So if you take uh, very sandy soils, okay, that drain very well, they don't, midges just don't go near them. So what you've got to be very careful around your stable yard is if you've got leaking water troughs and grass and that uh and you know so you've got water and keeps grass wet all the time also the other thing your buckets if you're going to turf out your buckets you don't just throw them on the grass you pour them down a drain okay so you're not creating ideal uh areas for the the midges to breed and so you know the deep litter system if if they're not Throwing it with uh, throwing water all over it every day, you won't have an environment where the midges will breed. Yes, it becomes uh, 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 a lot more. You'll have a lot more fungal spores and that sort of thing in the uh, in the stable when you go in, but the midges are not going to uh, 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 be breeding in that because there's not enough water in there. It needs to be moist, damp soil. So, yes, look outside. Go and have a look. Leaking taps throwing out buckets, all of those sort of things. Just be very careful that you're not creating ideal conditions for the midges to grow. Turnout times, Alan, final question, I promise. Turnout times, uh, two hours after sunrise, two hours before sunset, close your windows. Um, dew on the grass, what, what does that play? Is that just a point? If there's dew on the grass, it's too early for them to go out? Too early, or yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so basically you, you, your two hours isn't up. Yeah, I don't think there's, there's, there's even when, you know, uh, I don't think the dew ever stays more than two hours after, uh, after sunrise. And uh, so it's just, you're a little too early. You should be waiting so a little. Longer. It's just a pointer. It's not that the dew yeah. attracts the midges or anything like no, that. It's no. just a pointer. Yeah. And, uh, and first frosts, that's a pointer as well. That means that it's got yeah. cold enough to pretty much eradicate 
because they're not replicating um, the virus in those conditions or they kill the midge population? Well, it doesn't kill the midge population, but what it stops is the hatching of your, your uh, larval stages out of your breeding grounds, okay? So they will just sit there until the next season when it gets too cold. But you still have adult midges around that are infected. Mm -hmm. So if the adult midges are, uh, you know, during, uh, let's say it's, uh, you, you have the first frosts, and then it gets uh, a few days later, you get a, a, a nice warmish spell again. There's nothing stopping those adult midges that are already alive going out and looking for their last blood meal before they go and lay their last uh, a batch of eggs or cl a clump of eggs for, uh, before basically dying for the winter. Uh, so, yes, the first frost tells you that others aren't going to be hatching out, but you still may have some of the adults which are going to live for another few weeks until they die and then they don't go to play a role through the rest of winter. Right. And it's only the females that cause the trouble, is it? Uh, unfortunately, yes. Female uh, mosquitoes and female midges are out looking for a blood meal and uh, taking, uh, uh, behaving as micro syringes while they do it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Can't be trusted. Cannot be trusted. Alan, uh, thank you. I think you. we need to be careful with statements like that, Aiden. <laughs> On that note, it's been highly informative. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for all your, for your valued contribution. And uh, let's hope the situation in Thailand uh, gets cleared up and, and uh, we're holding thumbs for the rest of this season. Hopefully it's not too bad. Excellent. Thank you very much, Aiden. Keep Thanks on. for the chat. Take care. Yes, bye-bye.